All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Hello again. I'm so excited that you all are here joining us for this really important conversation. To start us off uh, will be our Provost, Dean, and Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Stephanie Rowley. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. I can't believe that just two days ago we sent out the call for this, this uh, gathering and that we have almost 400 people here from our community. It really warms my heart. I'm sitting here, uh, so this is my apartment on TC's campus and literally my Zoom station here uh, as I look out the window is looking directly at TC looking at the flag that hangs above TC that is currently flying at half mast and um, and it makes me miss you all and uh, it also makes me so happy and so proud that we've been able to get together even to share all of our thoughts and feelings in this difficult and challenging time. It's really hard to believe for me that it's been um, almost three months now since we've gone remote since we decided to move our, our uh, classes online and since all of our staff and faculty are working from home. Um, and it, it makes me think a lot right now about what has happened with the COVID-19 virus um, and where this journey for me in, in some ways really started, which is um, just a deeply personal experience of, um, of, I think, pain and loss as I've watched people uh, in black and brown communities and low income communities across the country, across the world, who have been really ravaged by the virus. As someone living in New York now and having just moved from Michigan, two states that were hardest hit by the virus, um, and then also just watching the patterns of the way it has affected uh, black and brown communities in New York who are living in housing projects and urban centers like Detroit. Um, it's been really personal. As I've looked at my Facebook feed and I'm looking at the, the uncles and brothers and sisters and grandfathers, grandmothers who have died from the virus, I've just been reflecting so much on uh, systemic and structural racism that really is woven into the fabric of our country. Um, and so it was at, with this as a backdrop, I think, that um, we move into this moment with the murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd. And it was with this as a backdrop that I think we moved into um, feeling this level of pain and confusion and outrage, um, certainly for me. This burden was really, I think, compounded greatly by the, uh, what we're, who we're calling Central Park Amy, a reminder of how liberal politics can end in white supremacy when we think that no one's watching, that police brutality can unfold in ways that I think we hadn't imagined, but also um, that we could have a national and even international response that I think has surprised many of us. As a black woman, I see these stories literally every day. Um, but I have to say that this sort of renewed action on the part of our community has heartened me for sure. I'll be honest, I really wanted to say or do something over the past week or two, as folks have been saying and doing, but I was held back really by this feeling that I hadn't done enough. So who was I to speak out and uh, make a pledge of what I was going to do when I felt like my work hadn't been focused enough, that I hadn't been engaged enough around these issues of structural racism in places where I could make a difference. And so I certainly, I felt a lot of, um, I don't know if guilt is quite the word, but we'll say guilt about where I had, uh, had shortcomings. But then I realized that I can't let my own shortcomings keep us uh, from our opportunity to get together as a community, to share with one another, to lean on one another, to point out our own shortcomings in the spaces where, um, where they happen. And so I called on my friend, Dr. Janice Robinson, and said, you know, if we were in TC right now, you would be um, putting together a community gathering. Can we do that? 
even if it's on Zoom? And she said, absolutely. And so here we are. Um, I really appreciate her partnership in so much of, of this work. Um, so late last week, we hatched this idea and over the weekend put together all of the details and we invited these amazing speakers to come and share their own re reflections today. Um, I should note that we had big ideas for how to promote dialogue and to invite action. Uh, some of those were thwarted by Zoom, unfortunately, when we learned that over 500 people had signed up to participate today, we realized um, that we couldn't do things like breakout rooms and offer um, uh, small intimate gatherings for reflection. Um, and so we're gonna come back and do that in another forum because we do recognize that people want to talk. People wanna think about how they can improve this world that we're living in, how they can take action, and also to share their hurt and pain. So I hope that this gathering today and our collective hurt and outrage is a first step toward the difficult work ahead at TC. I'll return to my work of decolonizing our curriculum, of increasing equity and inclusion, and of amplifying voices of the marginalized. And I certainly invite you all to join me. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Dr. Rowley. I really appreciate those words of reflection about how, how we've gotten here. Um, you know, we were a little sad that we weren't able to engage in in-depth conversations in the ways that we had hoped, but we did find a few ways to be able to engage with one another today while we are still sharing this space. So one way you can do that is by using the hashtag TCJusticeNow on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, to connect with one another uh, through social media. You can also send a chat to the panelists. We've got an amazing lineup of panelists who would love to hear your words of encouragement um, and support about their messages. Additionally, we have a few staff members um, behind the scenes that if you need any help with any technical support, um, any accessibility support, uh, just please send a message to the panelists and someone will reach back out to you. Uh, additionally, we have closed captioning available. So if you just click the closed captioning CC button at the bottom of your screen, uh, you'll be able to see the words as, as they are spoken. And um, finally, as a way to engage, uh, I'm really excited that we will be using the Mentimeter tool. Um, it's an online platform that some of you may remember from the State of the College address back in the fall. So we're gonna do our first mentee um, post now. So if you can use your phones or your laptops and go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. It's also in the chat box and use the code 797501. Uh, we have our first question for you and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that we can all see the responses. Uh, just one moment. So in one word, what are you, what feeling are you bringing to this space? All right, we have over 200 responses. Keep on posting if you would like to. Um, I'm gonna start reading off some of the words that are, are surfacing. Um, the biggest one being hope, which I think is um, so needed in this moment. I'm also seeing sadness, frustration, confusion, anger, um, but I'm also seeing solidarity, empathy, optimism, determination, um, and I think it's really beautiful to see that there's such a wide a range of emotions that we're feeling and bringing to this space. I think the events, the protests, the riots, the murders of these past few weeks have um, 
really triggered so much in us. Um, and so I hope that we'll continue to see these themes elaborated in our, um, the rest of these reflections. And as we have already brought in some of our feelings into this space, um, I also want to continue bringing into the context um, uh, that Dr. Rowley had um, described um, that we are at this moment that we are in. Um, we have lost so many beautiful souls within the Black community in these past few months. Maude Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, uh, Taylor McDade, Tony McDade, George Floyd, um, all at the hands of the police. And while we're beginning to see the marks of justice coming to the surface, there's still so much more work to do. We still have so much work to do. Um, I really want to take a moment to reflect on the losses. Um, and so I would like for us to have a moment of silence. We'll be holding the silence for 52 seconds. Uh, 52 seconds is just a tenth of the time that Derek Chauvin kneeled into George Floyd's neck, causing his death. Um, as these 52 seconds pass, I hope we can reflect on how we're feeling in this space, the trauma that we've been dealing with, how we've been able to support one another. Um, and after we finish the 52 seconds of silence, I will read a brief excerpt from a poem uh, from Alexis Pauline Gums, a queer Black feminist poet um, whose words um, about breathing um, from um, a poem that she wrote on breathing about Eric Gardner, uh, she refer surfaced for this conversation around George Floyd. Um, so I would like for us to begin our 52 seconds now. Return to the place where you learned how to breathe, where night washed itself into your dreams. Return to the place where you learned breathing was bigger than you, of your fears of dogs, bats, and sea creatures, and would continue all night long without you trying to keep it going. Human freedom is like that, unstoppable as the ocean at night. Sometimes crashing is just louder, like right now. Thank you all for sharing that moment with, um, together. And um, speaking of poets, um, I would like to introduce our first speaker for this event, our very own TC poet, Dr. Yolanda Seeley Ruiz, Associate Professor of English Education and founder of the Racial Literacy Project. Oh, please be sure to... Thank you, Lily. Good afternoon. I greet each of you in peace and love. I thank the leadership of Teachers College for holding such an event and extending an invitation to me to share some thoughts about recent events in the nation. These past few months have been difficult. The mind-blowing impact of COVID-19 on humans around the globe, and particularly humans in black and brown communities, has been a source of deep sadness outrage, and seemingly immeasurable grief. The recent killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery served as reminders to Black people that our lives don't matter in this country. What is perhaps different this time around is that these tragedies, these murders, have taken place at a time when the world is experiencing social isolation. 
There aren't big stadium sports to distract us, bars and nightclubs to drink and dance away the reality of what ills others. For many Americans, there's not the hectic commuting back and forth and the sole focus on the bubble that most create as a living space. We are collectively sitting still and this has forced many to pay attention to things that ail their fellow human, things they would normally miss or ignore in the rapid movement of their lives. Black people have experienced this trauma on and off camera for over 400 years. Perhaps because of these exceptional times, we are in more or recognizing it and adding their voice, dedicating their time and placing themselves on the line. While the worldwide protests are heartening to black people and people of color who experience intersectional marginalization at the hands of white domination and patriarchy, America must understand that our demanding the justice of all involved in these recent killings is what any other group or person would do. It's, if swift and adequate justice is not served, we will know that America is not serious. In the same way, after all the protesters return home and people go back to their lives, living and teaching as they were before, not seeing as they were before, we will recognize all of this as performance. Black Americans need social justice and economic justice that is sustainable. And while it is our fight, not one that we asked for, I do believe it is incumbent on all of us as humans who share this earth to want for our brothers and sisters what we want for ourselves. Change will not happen without consistency. There are likely very powerful people on this call or those who will operate in spheres of influence soon. Those who will affect policy and practice. The question is whether or not you will sustainably interrogate your own beliefs, change your own practices and influence policies that bring about the change that matters change that will last. Only you know the answer to this. My hope and prayer that the answer is yes. And I asked TC, how will they break free from its institutionalized role in racism that is embedded within? Racism is part of TC's culture in the same way that racism is part of our society's culture. A theory that I am working on is called the archeology span of the self. It is one of six components of my racial literacy development model that Dr. Angelo Costa helped me to visualize. The arc of self requires each of us to conduct a deep excavation of where these issues live within and how it impacts how we live and serve. At the base of this model is critical love. Critical love is a profound and ethical commitment to the communities we serve. It is rooted in care and respect and promoting a sense of belonging and liberation. And as you engage in the excavation and removal of stereotypes, biases, and racist beliefs, I suggest you replace what you remove with critical love. Critical love is what Bell Hooks and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King wrote about, love that is fundamentally connected to justice. The two cannot be separated. I am asking you all, are you prepared to love in this way? loving toward the recognition of everyone's full humanity. What I am hoping for today as we come together in this virtual space is for people to be willing to have honest conversations with themselves and others, to be honest about the ways they have ignored the presence of racism, how they have not always treated some of their students, colleagues or neighbors of color with respect and kindness, ways that they have engaged in racist and anti-Black practices, whether it's staunchly believing that the N-word should be used in classrooms as a constitutional right, in spite of all of the hate tethered to that word, knowing its history and legacy, but still fighting for the use for, for using it versus fighting against the use of it. I hope that they are willing to have and sustain these conversations, unearth any internalized beliefs, that they are somehow better than their fellow humans and to think of ways to dismantle those beliefs and replace them with critical love. In my classes at TC and my professional learning, I ask students and participants to write for full presence. This requires them to commune and write down with all that would block them from being fully present during our time together. 
I am here today asking my colleagues, TC alum, students, and all of you who are listening, what will it take for you to be fully present and remain fully present in the fight for equity and justice? What is blocking you from what Dr. Bettina Love calls being full co-conspirators, having some skin in the game for those who don't share your background and your struggle? What will it take for you to remain fully present in the fight against racism when it creeps up in your classroom, in your meetings, your community settings, your place of worship? And what will your act of interruption look like? My recent archaeology of the self around all things love led me to write a book of poetry titled Love from the Vortex and Other Poems. As a way of encouragement, I would like to leave you with a brief poem called Just Us, Justice. Here is my invitation for you to bend towards justice. My arc of self bends in favor of love. Asking hard questions and waiting for answers that don't offer conclusions, just more wonderings about how to live a life worthy of the children who come after us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Celie Ruiz, on, about, for that reflection on critical love. Um, critical love is so important in this movement um, and understanding that the actions that we continue to see in protests and rallies um, in mobilizing are all acts of critical love. Next up, we have Dr. Dennis Chambers, graduate of the, uh, our Adult Learning and Leadership Program, educator and youth leader and public safety officer here at TC. Welcome, Dr. Chambers. Thank you, thank you. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate this opportunity to, to share my reflection. Uh, as I reflect on what's taking place in our society, I hold my breath with varied emotions that flood my mind constantly. The many experiences that I've encountered continue and continue to encounter only serve to highlight the multiple shades of America that, con that currently exist today. We have again encountered another tipping point in our history. The hope is that a swift and just change will occur. Without the prospect for a better tomorrow, we currently sit and waddle in a space that is still filled with a lot of uh, separation and hope and hopelessness. Recently, we mourned the death of George Floyd, Deanna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery. Prior to them, we had Amadou Diallo, Manuel Loggins Jr., Ronald Madison, Kendra James, Sean Bell, Eric Gardner, Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, and Alton Sherling, just to name a few. Way too many. These deaths at the hands of law enforcement and private citizens reflect a broken America, where for some dreams are extinguished before they can be nurtured or born. Without the capacity to dream, hope dies. The loss of hope exacerbates emotions such as, such as fear, pain, and anger. The perpetrators of violence not only uses fear, but also cultivate fear and bigotry towards differences in general and skin color in particular. Fear from the agitator oftentimes is buried in ignorance. Fear for the victim and the observer reflects a powerlessness and often ongoing trauma that currently exists. Pain can be seen and experienced buried in institutions that perpetuate cycles of violence. Pain is felt and experienced from the agitator in a mind numbing implementation of evil. Victims experience it both mentally and physically, and oftentimes bearing it internally. Over time, it manifests itself in various forms in our society. Anger is the unconscious and conscious implementation of cycles of violence in the name of right. Anger is experienced both in the observer and the intended victim as a rage connected to this type of victimization. Public and civil unrest is an example of just this. These emotions are not just the only emotions experienced. 
but they do represent emotions that are currently taking place in our society. Sometimes these emotions are intertwined and oftentimes it stagnates social action. Other times it fuels social change. For me, it's not easy to reflect on my experiences in such a public forum of this nature, but it is important not just for myself to find my voice, but more importantly to take action. I'm not alone in often choosing comfort and normalcy over discomfort and challenge. But as we have seen in history, change is a necessary part of evolution. It is not hard to romanticize the notion of being a change agent. The reality, however, is that change often occurs through discomfort or challenge. A former professor at the college, Jack Mesero, reasoned that change often happens at a juncture of disorientation. Change not only occurs personally, but it needs to occur in organizations and social systems as well. A good place to start change is in our educational learning system. I will argue that real change needs to occur in these systems in order to foster greater understanding and knowledge. Growing up and understanding that what I was being taught in school didn't always represent my reality created many personal challenges to my own learning. There were definitely a disconnect and thankfully I was able to supplement my learning outside of these establishments. Our educational system needs to be fixed. We know it. But some political and social agendas determine the type of education that is taught and for who it's taught to. We all can acknowledge the power of education but not everyone is given access to the same type of education. Better and more extensive learning need to also take place in our law enforcement establishments. As we can see, training is not adequate and it further compounded with the impact of a fractured public educational system. Uninformed and inadequate information leads to uninformed and inadequate action. Our political and economic and social lives are all driven with a notion of being competitive and winning. Most currently aspire to win at work, life, and love. We are also bombarded each day by competitive political bravado. As a society, we need to reshape our concept of competition from a win-lose economy to one in which we can all win. Racism and oppression privilege will always raise a flag to this win-lose ideology. A truly liberated society can only thrive in spaces where everyone wins. This pervasive ideology consumes our way of life and only with acknowledgement can we make significant change. My success is not predicated on someone else's demise. We can all attest to the fact that blame, the blame game doesn't work. Blaming others for our circumstances could only go so far. The time has come to expect more and also demand more from yourself, others and institutions. Be the change agent and don't expect change from someone else or some other entity or organization. Now all this has been said before and I know it sounds like music to the ears, but fear, pain and anger will continue to exist in our society unless we create real liberation for all. Lastly, we know and acknowledge that there are multiple shades to America, but we must now shed light and who we all are and where we all need to go as a society for true freedom and liberation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chambers. Um, I really appreciate those words um, and especially bringing, resurfacing those names that are so important. Um, it's imp so important that we continue to say the names of those that we have lost in our community um, and to continue moving um, in their honor. Um, we have been getting so much love from you all in the comments um, from the chat room. Thank you all so much. I encourage our panelists to send some of that love back to our incredible audience and to your peers too um, by selecting all panelists and attendees and, and leaving a few encouraging um, words. So up next, we have Dr. Dr. 
Amra Shabik Al Reyes, Associate Professor of Practice in Education Policy and Social Analysis, and the author of the book, The Cat I Never Named, A True Story of Love, War, and Survival. Um, this book is her memoir on genocide, resilience, and education. Um, so welcome, Dr. Shabik Al Reyes. Thank you, thank you, Lily. Hello, everyone. I am both honored and humbled to have been asked to share my thoughts with you today. Like many of you, I am encouraged by the thousands around the world who are marching in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. But I am also deeply concerned with what tomorrow will bring for the Black voices who are seeking to be heard and respected in today's America. I still wonder if there will be a real change in our society. The answer to this question is not dependent only on the strength of the white supremacist movement that threatens black lives from the societal fringes, but on the everyday covert racism that lives and breeds amongst us. I worry about silent racists who fear for their place in this increasingly outspoken and diverse America. Those covert racists include our friends, our colleagues, and our neighbors, they live and work amongst us. They're the reason why the polls failed to predict the last election. Their racism remains hidden unless it can be safely practiced and displayed without repercussions. They're the kind of racists who were my neighbors in Bosnia and who put my name on a list of Muslim girls to be raped. I didn't know who they were until my life was on the line. This is the kind of racism that allows the merciless killings of black people. This silent, approving racism is what has allowed George Floyd's killers to steal his last breath uninterrupted. This kind of hidden racism is embedded in all domains of American life. And it is that kind of racism that is our principal impediment to change. Please think of those Americans who claim they're not racist that they had somehow decided that encountering a black person on an Ivy League campus is a sign of danger. Please consider the white gatekeepers who veiled their racist sentiments in saying that the kind of research pursued by a black candidate for a faculty position is not exactly the kind of work we need within our institutions. Or simply think of a white mother who quietly encourages her child not to play with a black friend. I am not calling this institutional racism for a reason. Institutions are empty concepts without us in them. Institutions do not exist in vacuum, away from our communities. They are the reflection of who we truly are. Our police force does not act in isolation. They are a representation of our communities, policies, and rules. By calling this institutional racism, we allow the silent, covert racists and power holders to hide behind the facade of rules and practices that have perfected their devaluing of black lives for 400 years. This is the kind of racism that ensures no change occurs, even when thousands march in our streets. We can change our world, but only if we end this kind of racism here and now. And if we don't, racism may win in America the way it did in my old country, where mass killings, rapes, and genocide ended the lives of thousands of Muslims. We need to act now in unity with Black people. But we have to go beyond the protests, beyond public statements, beyond written missions, and demand that Black people get their earned and rightful seat at the table in a new, equal, and just America. Thank you. Thank you so much. Those were some powerful, powerful words um, that I, I'm uh, really going to be reflecting on. Thank you so much for that. Uh, this concept of silence is so important because if we cannot say injustices, if we cannot speak 
these, what is happening, then we cannot address it. We cannot change it. We cannot move forward. Um, so up next, we have Dr. Sonia Douglas Horsford, Associate Professor of Education Leadership and Founding Director of the Black Education Research Collective. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, Dr. Douglas Horsford. Oh, you're still muted. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Lily. And thank you, Provost Rowley and Vice President Robinson for the invitation to participate in this very important gathering and for your leadership during such challenging and uncertain times. But my name is Sonia Douglas Horsford, and it is really great to be with all of you today. And I'm honored to be a member of the TC community. None of us can be free until all of us are free or so the saying goes. Yet today in 2020, in the midst of the coronavirus outbreak, police killings and mass uprisings across the country, we are surrounded by loss, grief, suffering, and death. And that despite the great devastation that these major traumatic experiences are having disproportionately on Black Americans and our communities, roughly 40% of our fellow American citizens support the current administration and its policy agenda, reflecting a rejection of the belief in liberty and justice for all. And to me, this is the reality we must contend with as a society, as citizens, and especially as researchers who value knowledge, truth, and education as the practice of freedom. As a mother of three who wants what is best for her children, I continue to wrestle with what constitutes the best type of learning environment for young people in a society that does not value their intellect, culture, or humanity. I also question how we as a nation make assumptions about the racial makeup of our schools, which have implications for how equity, diversity, and inclusion are defined and what problems such efforts actually solve. Much of our work around educational equity, however, remains a dilemma for the cause of justice for African descended people because it overlooks black voices, experiences, and research perspectives on the purpose and values of education, which have always been linked to equality and freedom. Freedom from racial violence, subjugation, and discrimination and the enjoyment of equal rights and protections of citizenship granted under the law. To quote Zora Neale Hurston's critique of the Brown versus Board of Education decision of 1954, she said that the whole matter revolves around the self-respect of my people. How much satisfaction can I get from a court order for somebody to associate with me who does not wish me near them? And this is the heart of the issue, the self-respect of black people in a society where black lives remain devalued and unprotected. To its credit, equity, diversity, and inclusion work in education has been effective in bringing attention to the problem of inequality in schools. Yet work conducted through the dominant paradigm, or what James Baldwin conceptualized as the white gaze, remains detached from the racial realities associated with growing up Black in America, where innocent Black children and youth are murdered at the hands of law enforcement without consequence, and controversial is the declaration that Black Lives Matter. How might equality and justice for Black people ever be achieved if segregation is in fact subject to the whims of the members of society? What have we learned from our complicated history of police brutality in Black communities? What will the education of Black children look like uh, post-COVID? How, if at all, will this current moment impact the social, emotional, academic, cultural, and intellectual lives of Black children now and for generations to come? And white children too. It is clear based on the state of segregation, violence, trauma, and the unacceptable learning conditions and outcomes in our schools that the field of education research has in some ways failed us. That research on race through the white gaze lacks the capacity to create policy change for black education. It is incapable of seeing, knowing, much less understanding the nature of race and racism, experiencing it firsthand and that this methodological deficiency in education research has left us unprotected and ill-equipped for the moment that we currently find ourselves in. This is our inconvenient truth. So where do we go from here? Let us begin with those most impacted by the moment. We need more research that centers the voices and perspectives of Black students, parents, teachers, education, and community leaders, believing that those who are closest to the issues and the problems are best equipped to tell their own stories and to develop solutions. 
And this is the work that the Black Education Research Collective has been engaging in for the last three years by creating space to conduct transdisciplinary research focused on the effective education of Black children and youth. Bringing together students and faculty at Teachers College and experts on Black education across the country to collaborate across intellectual disciplines and ideas to conduct research on race that is methodologically sound and relevant of working with policymakers and practitioners to develop solutions that lead to material change and action. That through research and scholarship, that through our teaching, our advocacy and protest, whether in the streets or at the ballot box, we must confront our troubled history of race and racism in this country. And if we're serious about taking up the difficult work of producing systemic and sustainable change, that we must center the voices, the experiences, and the perspectives of those who are most at risk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Horace Ford. Um, I really appreciate your words around bringing um, everything that we're talking about back into our work so that we continue to practice, not just personally in our relationships, but know how to implement um, and work, th um, implement anti-racist um, pedagogies into our work, into our classrooms, into our research. Um, and so next we have Dr. Marie Maville, Professor of Psychology and Education, as well as our um, ombudsperson um, here at TC. Thank you so much, Dr. Maville. Good afternoon. Thank you, Lily. And I'm honored to share this town hall space with all of you today. A few years ago, I was given a mentoring award here at TC that involved doing an address. I gave this talk in February 2017 right after the last presidential inauguration, when the streets of the nation's capital and cities around the country and world were taken over by women and girls, cis and trans, their allies, all dressed in pink hats. At the time, I described how the muzzling of free minds and voices at the highest levels of government and institutions continued, as well as the importance of resistance to systemic oppression. I describe the term we are all now intimately familiar with, resistance, not as a negative defensive posture as it's sometimes viewed, but actually as a positive, critical step toward wellness, empowerment, social engagement, advocacy, and change. The millions of people protesting that year, as well as today, on the streets and through tweets, are actually engaged in important psychological interventions that address social injustice. In short, resistance is not futile. In fact, it is essential to our health and well being, even our lives. Our identities as racial and cultural beings profoundly affect much of our psychological makeup and actions, including our health status, as we've seen with the COVID pan pandemic. A single experience with racism in school or college can affect whether an individual continues in a field or even an institution or not. The righteous anger and actions so bravely on display in the past few weeks highlight how pervasive these oppressive systems remain in American life. As a result of these harsh realities, I strongly believe that what is personal and political therefore must become part of our professional work as educators, psychologists and counselors, healthcare workers and policymakers. In other words, the personal is the political, is the professional. As a psychologist, I view a key issue of systemic oppression, systemic racism, is how it enters our hearts and minds, though never our souls, our belief in our humanity. By internalizing racism, you may come to believe negative connotations, lies, misrepresentations about who we are, who people of color are, or that something is your fault or your deficit that you need to deal with. And sure, of course, it's always true. We do need to deal with our thoughts, our feelings, our behaviors. But it is more about figuring out actions and strategies that can change systems and not bring systems negative impact on us. Earlier, I mentioned how the personal is the political is the professional. All of us today, especially students, 
must live with this painful fact. And to be honest, like some of you have already expressed, I am worried about us, our many communities, even our country. But I am also angry and mo mobilized. And like many of you said today, I have hope and faith in you, in us, our families and communities, and our abilities and strengths that as Dr. Joe White, the godfather of black psychology says, to find movement and momentum through adversity. The power of you, each and all of you, of us, is being felt today with each step in the march to justice, with each word that calls out the truth, with each strategy that overturns systemic injustice and opens the door of our institutions to all of us. For as long as brilliant, compassion, competent people who make up our many communities in this country are stopped from learning, criminalized for our very existence, we can never stop this fight. We must always resist. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mabel. Um, yes, resistance is so important. It's so much of what we're seeing right now and so much of the work that we'll continue to be doing, um, as you said, as we move with, as we have movement and momentum. And I think today is just the start of this momentum here at TC. And I really want to continue to see the growth of these kinds of conversations here um, in this community. And so I would like to actually take this moment to bring us back to menti.com. Um, to hear some of your voices. We've heard from some incredible speakers, some really powerful words. Um, and so now we want to hear a little bit from you about how you've been moving through this space. So if you can go back to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I, and use the code 797501. Um, and we'll go to our next question, which is, who or what has inspired or motivated you during these times? I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen as well so you can all see the responses as they come in. All right, I'm seeing my students, I'm seeing shared spaces, protesters, student voices. Family. Everyone who I never expected to speak up that is speaking up and loud. My daughter, family, community leaders. Protesters, poetry. Latosh Morrison, friends, Dr. Barbara Wallace, I hope you're here with us, shout out to you. Young activists, telling my story. I think we've seen today how important stories are um, and how important storytelling is to this movement. Dr. Dennis and Sharon Chambers, my father and mother. Oh, really want, beautiful that we have family here in the space. Prophetic love.
Great, thank you all. Um, we're gonna go to our next question, which is what supports or actions would you like to be a part of here at TC? So we wanna keep the conversation going. Um, how can we continue to keep this, this conversation going? What can we do as a community? Reaching the youth, dialogues and discussion, more resources for our classrooms, free space to share, DEI work, anti-racist workshops, learning circles. Pro-social justice curriculum review, research, continued conversations. Black Education Research Collective, which Dr. Horsford is the founder and director of um, habitual forums. So we're not just doing this once or twice, but really creating a culture where, ex where dialogues, dialogue is expected and continuous. Meditation training, I think meditation can be a really powerful tool. Um, cross conversations, resource bank for educators, increasing and celebrating diversity on campus, activism toolboxes, change policies, faculty diversity, continued conversations. Amazing. These are all incredible suggestions, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, you can, if after you um, respond, you'll get a notification um, that says to, oops, to email, that you can email me the results. So if you click on that and enter in your email address, you'll be able to get the results from our three um, questions that we discussed today. Um, on our end, we'll also continue, we'll also look at these results and think about how can we put this into our work and how can we continue to make space, um, create resources um, and opportunities so that we as a community can continue to grow. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. All right. So um, as we wrap up, we're gonna have a final word from Vice President Janice, uh, Vice President for Diversity and Community Affairs, Janice Robinson in just a second. Um, and she'll close us out. But before we do, um, we wanted to continue to learn from you and hear from you. And so we will be sending out a link um, to a Google survey that asks a few more, um, a few more reflection questions developed by Dr. Maville, um, including the questions that we discussed today. And so we're hoping that from those responses, we can take some of those and post them onto a website for TC so that we can see um, the work that you all are doing um, and continue to be in dialogue um, and community um, virtually with one another. Um, and yes, we're looking forward to more events. Um, so please stay tuned um, because you'll be hearing from us and we are really excited to continue doing this work. And so now I'm going to pass it off to Vice President uh, Janice Robinson, uh, who will give us the concluding remarks. Thank you, Lily. Uh, good afternoon. It is so comforting to, to be with you. Um, and, and I truly miss seeing you in the hallways uh, and at running around at, at TC. I, don't, I wanna first thank uh, Provost Stephanie Rawley um, for her leadership in, in carrying forward the support gatherings that we have. It's become very much a part of us 
uh, unfortunately, for really difficult reasons. But it's part of what we do. And it's been a joy to really collaborate uh, with her um, in putting this together. I too am angry and I'm tired. And it's okay to be angry and tired. We keep calling the names, we keep calling the names over and over of our murdered black men and women. But those names for me start with Emmett Till. I was a child when Emmett was killed in 1955. He was 14. I mean, he, he was 14 years old. There is a sense of, of slow anti-Black violence that affects each of us, that continues. And we've heard really moving and, and, and important words from our colleagues. But what I wanna do is just quickly, just leave you with some hope. And what I mean by that is hope that we not just keep talking only. You know, hope that each of us take the reasonable and swift actions with critical love, as our sister Yolanda C. Louise talked about, to be able to do this work on anti-Black racism in our lives and in our academic programs. I really want to just conclude by thanking everyone who's participated. Their, their words were so powerful and they were so personal. And I hope they've resonated for, for many of you. They also are inspiring. And so I just wanna quickly say a very special thank you to Dr. Stephanie Rowley and to Lily, our uh, MC, who's done a marvelous job, and Dr. Yolanda Seeley Louise and Dr. Stanis Chambers and Dr. Amra Sabak El Reyes, Dr. Sonia Hosford, Dr. Marie Maville, and I want to leave you with one quick thought, and that is maybe we can each take at minimum eight minutes and 46 seconds each day to reflect on where we are and what actions we are taking with others. I'm hopeful that we will gather together again soon and that there's significant work, actions, actions that need to be taken um, in our lives and in, the, in that teacher's college. And so I look forward um, to, to seeing everyone and to working with you. And this has just been terrific. Um, I'm sorry that we've had to gather for these reasons, but um, to bring us all um, here um, has been moving and important. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you all again so much for being here. We really appreciate ho holding this space with you all um, and getting to hear these beautiful reflections. Thank you so much to our panelists um, and to the Office of Diversity and Community Affairs and to the Office of the Provost for putting this programming together. We are just so appreciative. Um, I am very appreciative of having this moment to reflect and breathe with you all. Um, we're going to send out the Google survey link one more time before you all leave, but I hope that you move through your day um, with um, critical love and that you continue to advocate and um, respond and be there and check in with one another and support one another through these challenging times. Thank you all so much.